Hi everybody, welcome back to AP Psychology with me, Miss Baines, your teacher, where you can take advantage of being able to pause and rewind me as I deliver you our latest content. So go ahead and grab those felt-tip multicolored markers, get yourself a nice comfy space in which to work, and of course, don't forget those ever-important binder notes that go in lockstep order with this video called Unit 5, Video 5, or Forgetting. So we've talked about the processes of creating, storing, and retrieving memory. Now we need to talk about what happens when something goes wrong, right? What happens when we forget? There's a couple of different types of things that can go wrong that cause us to forget and the severity of forgetting. So we're gonna talk about that as well as what it means for us to instruct memories and that they can be false memories and how easily our brain likes to fill in the blanks with whatever it wants, right? That could be a faulty memory, right? So we'll talk about all of those things and then we'll talk about what it means for a bunch of different areas of our reality. Okay, so first up is what is forgetting? So forgetting is simply the inability to retrieve information due to one of three things. It's either poor encoding, storage decay, or retrieval. Poor storage is the decay of information, and poor retrieval is whether or not you have proper retrieval cues, right? Whatever it is, is that you're trying to get out of your memory stores. So have you ever heard the saying, tie a string around your finger? And when your mom tells you to go pick something up for you at the store, that you'll look down at your hand all day and remember so that you won't forget it, that's an encoding failure, right? We forget things, and we forget them easily as human beings. So let's talk about these three things. The first type of forgetting is an encoding failure, right? We can't remember what we did not encode. If we aren't paying attention or entering the information into our long-term memory in the first place, we will not even be able to retrieve it later because it doesn't even exist. Okay? Memory is not magic. The second type of forgetting is called storage decay. It's the poor durability of store memory which leads to their decay, but not their complete deletion. Right? They don't totally go away forever. They're not deleted. They're somewhere in there, but they're very, very faint. The third type of forgetting is a retrieval failure. Although the information is retained in the memory store, it cannot be accessed. You're having trouble pulling it out. Right? You're having some type of moment which, where you just can't access the thing that you need to remember. And Ebbinghaus showed us this with his forgetting curve. What he showed was an initial large drop here in retention, which is kind of like remembering the storing of the information, right? So an initial large drop in the retention of the information, but then it kind of evens out over time. Okay, so this is the typical forgetting curve for learning newly learned information. So if this is day zero, Right? This is when you first learned it, and then you get it at 100%. What that means is that you were properly encoding it, and you put it into your long-term memory. After one day, you have a very quick or the quickest drop of forgetting. This says what you are learning, right? right? Tomorrow, you're going to have your most significant amount of forgetfulness, you could say, of the storage decay. Then you will, for the rest of your process of remembering it, it will kind of even off, right? It's kind of interesting. So what does that say how much you're actually getting from, say, these videos or any traditional lecture activity that you do for school, right? You have to have more effort and have active processing of the things that you're learning because you're going to forget a lot of the things that I am telling you here, right? Which is why I always tell you, you have to invest your own brain into your own way of remembering this stuff and rehearsing it and going over and over and over it. 
until you finally really learn it, right? The more active that you are in the processing, the less lightly, the less likely you are to forget. Okay, so back to the forgetting curve. If you forget the most in the first day, when you have reviewed, which is each of these like peaks, right? You review the information and then you forget it dips when you review with way less review. The information you forget is less. So what it's saying is that over time it will kind of steady out. But what you're seeing here is that with the forgetting curve is that each, each of these points here that you are reviewing, the information that you're not just letting it sit there. If you don't review the information, this trajectory going down here is going to happen, right? It's going to go steeply down. It's going to keep going down if you do not review, study, or rehearse the information. Right? They believe this to be due to the gradual fading of the particular memory. Right? The memory trace in the brain. Remember what we talked about with memory traces with the engram, right? With the long-term potentiation, right? With engram. Long-term potentiation is the strengthening of the synaptic connections between neurons. Right? All this stuff from the beginning of the year is now coming together. The connections aren't as strong or efficient as they were when you first learned them. So you've got to be able to review the information over and over again in order to make those connections between the synapses stronger. Long-term potentiation. Barack in 1984 showed a pattern similar to that of Ebbinghaus with the forgetting and the retention of Spanish vocabulary over 50 years. So this is the time in years after the completion of the Spanish course that they used in their experiment. So let's just say it's Spanish 1 in high school, right? And you get it. You understand the vocabulary. It's all retained. Right? Look at how quickly in the first, you know, two years or three years after having learned it, it goes down. But then you see kind of levels off. Sure, there's a slight decrease, but what you remember after those first two years kind of maintains itself. And then a retrieval failure, although the information is retained in memory stores, cannot be accessed, okay? So it's just in there and you're having some kind of failure. And one example of a retrieval failure is called tip of the tongue, right? It's on the tip of your tongue. That's the phenomenon that means that you know it's there. You just can't bring out the information. Oh, I know who that guy is in that movie. What's his name again? Oh, I was just talking about him the other day. Oh my gosh. It's, right? That's what happened to all of us. That's T-O-T, -T, tip of tongue. If I were to show you a picture, that would be the proper cue. And then you would say, you would get it. But then it would just be tip of the tongue. And you don't have the proper cues to help you get it out. And that is called a retrieval failure. Okay, so let's talk about different types of forgetting. Other than the three kinds of failures that we talked about. Interference, okay? So learning some information may disrupt the retrieval of other information. As you're learning more and more, and as you're getting more and more information in there, stuff starts interfering with each other when you try to differentiate it. When you try to bring something specific out, right? When you're trying to retrieve it and use it, okay? So there's two types of interference, proactive, the way that I want you to think of proactive interference is like when you're being proactive, you're moving forward, right? Proactive, you're going forward. Like I'm being proactive to try to prevent lots of illness by eating healthy and exercising, right? I'm being proactive with my diet and my exercise. Proactive when you're moving forward. Proactive interference is when old information kind of moves forward and interferes with the new information that you're learning, okay? So if the old information is interfering with remembering the new information that you're currently learning, it means that you remember the old. You do remember the old, which blocks your retrieval of the new. 
I want you to write that down. Proactive interference is when you are remembering the old information and it blocks the retrieval of new information. Make sure that you write that down and understand that, okay? So let me give you an example to solidify it in your mind. Let's say that your cell phone was stolen and you had to go and go buy a new one. And let's just say you had to get a new phone number. And every time somebody asks you for your new number, you still keep on giving out your old one, right? So you're like trying to give out your new phone number. It's in your head somewhere, but you keep starting to say your old one. That would be an example of proactive interference. The old phone number is interfering with the learning of the new. Retro, like throwback Thursday, retro, wear 1970s clothing or 1990s clothing, right? Something like that. It's going back in time. Retroactive interference is when learning the new information interferes with the recall of older information. So it kind of moves backwards, right? So it's the new information interfering with the old. You are remembering the new information instead of the old stuff that's already in there. Write this down. Then that blocks the retrieval of old information. New information blocks the retrieval of older information. So let me give you an example of that. Okay, let's just say that currently you're taking a Calc AB class and all of a sudden, you can't remember how to solve a geometry question when your younger sibling asks you for help for their homework, right? You're so focused on Calc AB, you can barely even think back to that easy geometry question, right? Your remembering is so wrapped up in all that stuff that you're learning right now at school that you try to do some basic algebra or A plus B equals C or something like that, and you can't even solve for C. You're like, oh my God, I totally freaking can't even remember how to do basic math and here I am taking calculus. That would be an example of retroactive interference. Okay, so sleep. Let's talk about sleep and how that can kind of help. Sleep will help you avoid retroactive interference, thus leaving to better recall. So the moral of the story is study before you go to bed for any tests that you might have the next morning. It doesn't say that if you just stay up really late and cram all night long that you're going to remember any better. Let's just say that you do some homework and study until, I don't know, like 9 o'clock at night, and then you get a really good night's sleep. Just having slept is going to improve your memory, right? It's going to improve your memory, and that is what this graph here is showing us. Hours after having learned something, the nonsense syllables, right? The nonsense syllables being words that make no sense in the Ebbinghaus study. And that after sleep, their retention of all that information is so much higher than remaining awake all night long and studying. In fact, what it shows us is if, let's say, if you take what you learned in class today, right? You have a test on it tonight. You sleep, take a test on it tomorrow, your test score is going to be better tomorrow for having slept than it would if you just took it right after you learned the information. I find that super intriguing, right? It's pretty cool. All right, motivation. Motivated forgetting is what people are motivated to forget. <laughs> well, we're talking about Freud here. And as you know, he was an incredibly controversial um, scientist. And he's got some stuff to say about our unconscious and latent kind of meanings and things in our mind that is hidden in our unconscious and the underlying stuff that's going on in our interior thoughts, right? We all know that much about Freud. However, okay, so back to motivated forgetting. People will unknowingly revise their memories. And I totally buy into this particular part of what Freud is trying to tell us here. I absolutely believe he was on to something here, and that is we do not remember items that we do not want to remember. So this doesn't mean that someone is lying, okay, when they say they don't remember. It doesn't mean that someone is pulling your leg about it. What it means is that they are motivated to forget certain things that they don't 
want to remember. So they're not going to recall them as easily and that's what repression is, right? You could say that repression is kind of an example of this, which is a defense mechanism that we're going to talk about in a couple units from now in clinical psych, right? It banishes or destroys or gets rid of any anxiety producing thoughts, feelings, and memory from our waking or conscious mind, okay? So it pushes those walk of shame moments that, oh, I hate that I drank so much at that college party and that I was so flirty with my friend's big older brother. Ugh. Or it helps us to forget those incredibly more traumatic memories where God forbid we were abused verbally or mentally or physically or sexually, right? It goes into our unconscious so that we don't have to be thinking about it in our day-to-day -day reality. So why do we forget it? Memory stages. Memory stages can occur in any memory stage, we filter or alter or lose much of the information during these stages with sensory memory and short-term memory and long-term memory. During these stages with sensory memory and a short-term memory and long-term memory and then the retrieval of it. So I kind of like this graphic over here, right? It's showing like all the little bits of information here, right? Information bits and sensory memory. Well, we can't take all of those, right? So we only pay attention down here to a few of them. And then they're important to us, right? If, if they're important to us, we'll work them into our longer term memory and then we'll work that in and there'll be much less down here, right? What was in our short term memory goes into the long term mem memory right? With just a, bit, a few bits of that information that's there forever. And the other factors are only a few of them will even come out when it comes time to retrieve them, right? The, re, the very normal, typical process of creating, storing, and retrieving memories. But some memory loss is due to damage, right? Some kind of structural damage to the brain. And that brings us to a phenomenon known as amnesia. Amnesia is not the typical process of creating, storing, and retrieving memories. It is the partial or complete loss of memory due to some kind of damage, whether that damage is physical, psychological, or both, right? There is some damage to some part of the brain that has to do with remembering. Things like Alzheimer's, a stroke, a, a traumatic brain injury, maybe a car accident, maybe a fever, maybe some kind of illness or mental illness or psychological pain that has triggered some type of traumatic event and now you can't remember. Most memories from traumatic events will return over time, usually within a few days, right? Some people go into shock. Most people do not suffer from extreme long-term complete amnesia. Let's talk about the different types of amnesia. It's really easy to confuse the two different types of amnesia. Amnesia is not the typical process of creating, storing, and retrieving memories. It is partial or complete loss of memory due to some kind of damage, whether that be physical or psychological. Physical damage is damage to some part of the brain from things like Alzheimer's disease or a stroke or a brain trauma, maybe being in a car accident or even having some kind of an illness or virus or um, serious fever, right? A psychological cause, some type of traumatic event um, happens to somebody. Most memories will return over time, usually within a few days after the shock kind of wears off. Some people do suffer from complete amnesia permanently. Okay, here are the different types of amnesia. It's about what do you forget, okay? It's about what do you forget, and you should write this down next to your types of amnesia on your notes here. Anterograde, anti, right? Anti being after. Anterograde. This is the inability to remember ongoing events after the incident of the trauma or the onset of the disease that caused the memory loss or the amnesia. So again, I want you to ask yourself, what do they forget? 
a T, and T being after the incident. Similar to the anterior amnesia is going to not be able to form new ones. Or it's even more simple than that. Let's say they're in a car accident. Or let's say something like they were robbed, right? Traumatized, mugged, assaulted, right? They're not going to remember things during or right after the traumatic event. Like when they're asked by the police a whole bunch of questions, right? Retrograde, again, think back to before the incident. So it's the inability to remember events that occurred before the trauma or the incidents that set on the non-remembering, right? The onset of the disease that caused the amnesia. So as severely as they don't remember who they are or where they come from or who their family is, they don't remember if, say, they were in a car accident. They don't remember even having been in their car or driving that day or who they were with or where they were going and anything else about that day, right? So that's retro. Think throwback before the incident happened. All right, let's kind of shift gears here from memory construction. Forgetting, although this has a lot to do with it, and talk about memory construct. So while tapping our memories, tapping into our memories, like trying to remember things and think about how we're trying, we might be trying to remember very important things that we filter or fill in the missing pieces of information in order to make our recall more coherent or complete. Remember, the human brain does not like empty slots. It likes closure. Most of the time, this is very subconscious or unconscious thing that we just kind of automatically do. Although sometimes it can be kind of motivated, okay? And more conscious, so think of it as memory construction and that you're almost creating a memory in order to fill in the blanks. You're constructing that memory to fill in the blank. A vocabulary term here is the misinformation effect. You're incorporating misleading information into one's memory of an event. And again, it's not that you're doing it purposefully to lie. You don't do this to be deceptive or deceitful. Our brain just likes nice, neat, complete pictures with a little bow on top. So it fills in the gaps on its own. Okay, let's go back to a couple of units, the adult principles. We'll close in on things that we'll see have holes in them, enclosure, right? Of course we do it with our memories, whether we know it or not. Source amnesia is the, is the next type of amnesia. Source amnesia, which is another vocab term, is attributing or finding the cause of an event to be the wrong source, okay? So we have an experience, right? We heard or read or imagined, and we misattribute it. So let's just say, yeah, I was watching this TV show the other day when you actually heard it on online or heard it on the radio or from a friend, right? You forget where you learned the information to begin with. True versus false memories. Just like true perception and delusion, real memories or memories that seem real are very difficult to discern from each other. So just because a memory feels real doesn't mean that it is real. Our brain can tell the difference between real and false memories. That means that a memory is in the temporal auditory cortex. Right there, there would be no sensory record to be activated in the auditory cortex and your temporal lobe, right? If you add it, you didn't actually hear that part of your brain, it wouldn't be stimulated when you recalled that false memory. So if the brain was analyzed when you were told about how you heard the false fact, the temporal lobe would not be activated upon remembering that memory. Kind of interesting, right? There really is no constructing memories difference. So let's talk a little bit more about constructed memories and the research that surrounds them by a very important woman named Elizabeth Loftus. She is a huge name in this unit that you must, 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 must remember. She conducted a lot of research in this arena. What she did is she contacted parents of college students and obtained a list of childhood events that the students were asked to recall, okay? She talked to their parents and asked them for things that they did when they were little. Went to Disney on vacation, had a babysitter, went to, got lost in a shopping mall, spilt a punch bowl at a wedding or a party, um, saw Bugs Bunny at Disney World, right? But this is impossible because Bugs Bunny is not a Disney character at Disney World. But after repeated recall attempts over a period of several days, 
Many students claim to remember the bogus memory of seeing Bugs Bunny at Disney World. So what did she do after getting these childhood events? She added some false stuff in and sat down and was interviewing these college students. Would say to them, tell me about that time that you got lost at Atlas Mall when you were a little kid. That must have been so traumatic for you. And after a couple of days of bringing it up again and asking some questions, they were like lock, stock, and barrel. Like, oh my gosh, it was so awful. I remember that I finally found this police officer guy and I was crying hysterically. And I remembered all these horrible details about them giving me some water and calling my mom for me. And my mom came and found me, right? Then we got clarification from the kids' parents that they were never lost in a shopping mall. So what does that say about eyewitness testimony? Is it accurate? Can we really depend on eyewitness testimony to send someone to say prison for life, even death row? Can we do that? Because eyewitness testimony is filled with errors in memory the same way that people's memories are filled with mistakes. Right? There are errors, and it's still one of the main methods that police use to gain information about a crime. Right? Important things to remember are people's recollections are less influenced by leading questions if they're forewarned that questions could create memory bias. So even right now, being aware that the way that someone asks me a question is going to create memory bias on my part, it's going to help you avoid that passage of time. It allows original memories to fade. So ask right away when you're talking to someone for more accurate information or write things down. And then the age of the witness will also matter. Younger children and adults over 65 are especially susceptible to influence of misinformation. We'll talk about why in our developmental unit and a couple of other units, but let's talk about some ways now of how to improve memory. This is actually a whole separate standard by College Board, so it could definitely be on the test. You've got to study repeatedly recall of long term over a long term, right? We talked about this with Ebbinghaus and the forgetting curve. It's not just that you retain, you learn the information, it decays, but then you learn the information. When it decays, you review it again and let it decay. Review it again, it decays a little less. Review it again with even less decays. Spend more time rehearsing or actively thinking or studying about the material. You can't just sit there and be listening to my lectures or even reading a textbook. You have to rehearse it in your brain over and over again. You have to write things over and over again. Whatever it is that helps you the most, quiz yourself, make index cards. Those are all types of... The most valuable way to learn new material is to make it personally meaningful. So what does this mean? You think about how you've seen something in your life before, and then you use a mnemonic device to associate it. Right? Either with peg words, something that you've already stored, or you make up a story, or you chunk things together, you use an acronym. All of things will help you improve your memory, right? To activate those retrieval cues. Retrieval cues mentally recreate the situation in the mood. So if you're on a test question, and let's just say you're like, oh my gosh, I'm pretty sure that I know this. I just have to remember it. So you think back to when you learned it and try to visualize that learning experience or maybe like, I don't know, this would be in the set of notes. So I just think about what these notes look like or when I was taking those notes, those retrieval cues will help you remember and recall events and they are fresh before you encounter the misinformation. It will help you to recall the events and while they're fresh, they will minimize the interference. So test your own knowledge and not looking at the book, right? You don't just simply, bam, what's the answer? That's going to reduce the likelihood of interference and then metacognition, okay? Metacognition is when you rehearse the information and determine what you do not yet know. This is a big word and I want you to write it down because it's important. Metacognition is knowing what you know. 